Good morning, everyone. Bill, thank you for that uh, gracious and eloquent introduction. Uh, I have a new job for you. <laughs> uh, I also appreciate your drawing attention to the importance of students and the key role that they play here at AMS, uh, and doing so uh, in such a nice and gracious fashion. Um, AMS meetings are very, very important to NOAA. It's really a pleasure for me to be here and welcome everyone for joining us for this session. I think the symposium is a very important one. I'm delighted to have an opportunity to kick it off uh, and give you some thoughts about where we are at NOAA, what we're doing. I don't need to tell you, uh, this crowd, that 2011 was a banner year for extreme events. Today what I'm going to do is give you sort of a 30,000 foot uh, level uh, view of three different areas. One, where the science has taken us over the last couple of decades and our ability to forecast some of the kinds of events we've been seeing this last year. Two, what we need to do in addition to more science and better technology to prevent the loss of life that we saw, for example, in tornadoes this last year. And three, how NOAA is integrating social science research into its commitment to better protect families, communities, and businesses in a future that likely holds more extreme weather events. So let's get underway. Uh, I want to begin with 2011. NOAA has been very busy predicting the weather-related extreme events that we've seen this last year. 2011 is already in the record books as a year of historic extreme events. One of those new records is the number of events totaling at least $1 billion in damage. Last week we announced the 13th and 14th extreme weather events, each totaling at least $1 billion. These 14 events, shown on this slide, were identified using NCDC's current methodology, which is available on the NCDC website. Now I note that in a typical year, we would see three to four $1 billion events, and the previous record was nine such events. So to have 14 in one year is pretty uh, amazing. Uh, in addition to the 14 that are shown, you should be aware that data are still being collected and analyzed for three more events that are approaching a $1 billion in damage each. They include the, last, the late November northeast winter storm, uh, the April 1920 Midwest and Southeast tornadoes, and the August 18 to 21 Midwest and East high wind and hail events. The extraordinary nature of 2011 has been validated by other organizations that track and analyze weather and climate disasters, such as the reinsurance industries. Now, although different methodologies might give different results, everybody agrees that 2011 was an amazing and highly unusual year. Now I caution you that interpretation of these results is complex. There are likely a number of factors that contribute to the increase in number of costly disasters. These include more people, larger population, more people in harm's way because of migrations, uh, more and more expensive infrastructure to be damaged, and increases in the frequency or intensity of extreme weather and climate events. Regardless of the causes, the aggregate damage from these 14 events is estimated at well over $50 billion. The economic losses are far from the full picture, however. Nearly 650 lives were lost in these disasters, with over 1,000 people dead from all weather-related events from this last year in the United States. This number is almost double the yearly average of about 600 deaths from weather-related events. Each of these events is a huge disaster for the people who experience them. Collectively, they are an unprecedented challenge for the nation, for the safety of its citizens, the bottom line for businesses, and the societal stresses that they engender. Timely, accurate, and reliable weather warnings and forecasts are essential to our collective well-being but also to the nation's ability to recover and prosper. Now, I've emphasized how unusual this year has been, 
but a single year can just be an anomaly. What might we expect in the future? Globally, according to Munich Re, the frequency of extreme events has been steadily rising over the past 20 years. The number of meteorological and hydrological events each tripled during that period of time. NOAA provides weather and climate products and services on every spatial and temporal time scale, from minutes to decades and neighborhoods to global. Environmental intelligence is needed on every space and time scale in which decisions are made. We provide forecasts for short fuse events such as tornadoes, heavy rains, heat waves like the extremes we experience in every state this summer or solar storms, which are becoming more frequent and with greater impacts on GPS, air travel, electric power distribution. We track the progress of extreme events, such as the maturation of tropical depression into full-blown hurricane. NOAA's Hurricane Prediction Center tracks these potentially devastating storms at the regional level, but also on a very short time scale. Development of cold fronts in the Colorado into lines of severe tornadic thunderstorms along the Gulf Coast, or, for example, volcanic ash advisories to ensure safe air travel. We also generate climate forecasts weeks to months in advance, such as droughts in Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Georgia, etc. NOAA's Drought Monitor issues weekly reports of the current state of the drought across all areas of the country. Winter flooding events in North Dakota, the Ohio River Valley last spring, NOAA's scientists contributed heavily to the National Climate Assessment and other national and international assessments, and these assessments are important in providing an authoritative and comprehensive view of the state of the science with respect to extreme events. They consider scales up to global and provide projections out to the end of the century and beyond. So you can see the richness in all those tiles. Early outlooks. Spring flood forecasts are an example of climate forecasting. In 2011, we had the third consecutive year of flooding for the Red River. Our goal was to give that part of the country as much advance warning as possible this year, even earlier than the forecasts we typically produce for the rest of the country. Decision support services started acting in December, advising communities to pay attention and get ready. NOAA's National Weather Service released an initial spring flood outlook on February 18 that you see on the left here, warning of a risk for moderate to major flooding along the western border of Illinois for the Mississippi River from Wisconsin state line to St. Louis. A national spring flood outlook was later issued March 17, confirming that the same area of Illinois was under high risk of major flooding. We noted that many metropolitan areas had a greater than 95% chance of major flooding, including Davenport, Illinois, and Rock Island, Illinois. The actual ob observations shown here confirmed our predictions. St. Paul, Minnesota registered a flood stage March 25, and St. Louis, Missouri, April 23. The fact that they had more than a month of lead time to warn citizens and businesses of the flood made significant difference in the response. <clears throat> Flooding in the Midwest extended throughout the spring and summer, not ending in some places until August. These advance outlooks have a great deal, have a great impact on communities. The people of Cairo, Illinois, know just how important they are. On May 2nd of last year, the Army Corps of Engineers made the decision to blow up the levee at Birds Point, Missouri. The destruction of that levee lowered Mississippi River by three to four feet, saving Cairo from disastrous flooding. The trade-off, 130,000 acres of farmland became a muddy lake. The flooded farmland includes about 90 homes, but offsetting flooding the town of Cairo with a population of 2,800. To quote Major General Walsh, I'm sorry, Major General Mike Walsh of the Army Corps of Engineers, quote, every decision we make was calculated into public safety and protecting lives, unquote. This example shows how accurate and reliable forecasts are used to inform communities and emergency managers' decisions. So where have improvements in science and technology taken us? 
Thanks in advance to advances in radar instrumentation such as dropsons and steep frequency microwave radiometers and numerical weather models, today's five-day track forecast for hurricanes is as good as the three-day track forecast was a decade ago. This year, the forecast for Irene was spot on. And I'm going to run that again for you. Uh, as Irene headed toward land, our forecasts indicated that Florida, coastal Georgia, and South Carolina were not in her path. Forecasters accurately predicted both the initial landfall in North Carolina as well as a second landfall along New Jersey and Long Island. As part of our efforts to do proper economic valuation of our forecasts, we produced a track forecast for Irene based on methods used in 2001 to predict hurricane tracks. This track for 2001 is shown on the right. Now, of course, in 2001, we were only making three-day advanced hurricane forecasts, not the five that we do today. This slide shows what the forecast for Hurricane Irene would have looked like 10 years ago compared to today. On the left, you see the 2011 actual forecast track and the cone of uncertainty that was issued on Tuesday, August 23rd at 11 p.m. in 2011. At that time, there were 68 million people in Irene's forecast path in 2011. Compare this to what, how, to the number of people that would have been in harm's way in 2001 using the technologies that we had in 2001. Uh, so I mentioned 68 million in 2011. In 2001, it would have been 93 million. And as Craig Fugate uh, noted, uh, had we had 2001 track forecast for Irene, we would have had to evacuate the entire west coast, uh, east coast of Florida. Uh, and that was not uh, necessary because of the improvements in accuracy. So clearly we've made impressive progress in improving track forecasts. However, we've not improved the intensity forecasts. The graph on the left shows improvements in track from 1970 to 2007, and the graph on the right shows a glaring lack of improvement in intensity error since 1990. The Hurricane Forecast Improvement Project is looking to continue to improve the accuracy and reliability of hurricane track and intensity forecasts, extending lead times for hurricane forecasts with increased certainty and increasing confidence in hurricane forecasts. Let's switch from hurricanes to tornadoes and take a look at how we've done with improvements in forecasting tornadoes. This slide shows the number of deaths per million people in the United States since 1875. From roughly 1925 to 1980s, 90s, uh, the number of deaths per million significantly declined. The decline is due to a number of factors, better forecasts, radio communications, improvement in the construction of homes, etc. A 40% decrease in mortality has been attributed to use of Doppler radar. From 1980s and 90s to the present, the number of deaths per million has leveled off. Now, noticeably, 2011 stands out. It is an anomaly here. It is an exception to this trend. You'd have to go back 100 years to see similar numbers that we saw this last year, 1.8 deaths per million people. When we look more closely at the human dimensions, we see some alarming statistics. People living in mobile homes, which are the solid squares on here, have a far greater death toll than those who live in permanent homes that are the open squares. This is despite the fact that in 2000, only about 7.5% of the population lived in mobile homes. In 1975, roughly 2% lived in mobile homes. People living in mobile homes today are just as vulnerable as people were pre-1925 in the United States. One of the things we typically do is a service assessment to evaluate how well we did during different disasters. Uh, the service assessments from the April 25 to 28 outbreak, and outbreak of tornadoes in the southeast and the May 22nd Joplin tornado tell us that too many people still lost their lives or sustained injuries 
despite the lead times of 17 minutes or more. On April 25 through 28, 2011, tornadoes wreaked havoc across the southeast. The deadliest part of the outbreak occurred during the afternoon and evening hours of April 27, with 122 tornadoes resulting in 316 deaths across central and south Mississippi, central and northern Alabama, eastern Tennessee, southeast, southwestern Virginia, and northern Georgia. On May 22nd, an EF-5 tornado struck the Joplin, Missouri area, resulting in over 150 fatalities and more than 1,000 injured. Even the best weather forecasts don't always produce the results we need. In Joplin, the National Weather Service issued outlooks 48 hours in advance and warnings 17 minutes before touchdown. Overall, forecast offices did reasonably well. Pre-season preparedness, pre-event planning and staffing, decision support activities, overall situational awareness, and lead time. Tuscaloosa was advised five days in advance based on polar satellite images, and then again three days out, National Weather Service intensified the language of the advisements. In Joplin, the population decreases appreciably over the weekends, and May 22nd tornado hit Joplin on a Sunday. Though Joplin is in Tornado Alley, it's typically spared. However, despite these warnings, despite the lower population numbers that were out and about in Joplin, many lives were lost and the human impact was great. The weather assessments, uh, the service assessments for these events uh, bring home a number of key messages that we need to take to heart. There had been desensitization to the sirens and warnings. Warnings sort of lost credibility. There was confusion over multiple warnings. People said, sirens go off all the time. Why should I pay attention to this one? There's also a lot of confusion about where the warning areas were. Am I in a warning area or not? People didn't know how to evaluate their risk. Shall I wait until I actually see a funnel cloud before I take action? or should I do something as soon as I hear a siren? It's clear that warning messages need to be easily understood by the public and in many cases they have not been. If we are to expect good decision making, people need to have information they can act on and trust. Despite the popularity of social media and text messaging, the service assessment says that Weather Service has not taken full advantage of this capability. Ultimately, our job is to reduce fatalities and damages. How can we do a better job of accomplishing that goal? Doing so requires advances on many fronts. We need to continue to invest in research so that we can understand the factors that are conducive to, for example, tornado formation. On the hurricane front, we also need more research on what causes hurricanes to intensify. We also need technology such as dual pole, and not just new technology, but technology that we can adapt and mainstream. But a big new area that we must embrace quickly and fully is social science research. And this brings us to our concept, our initiative of the Weather Ready Nation. The frequency or intensity of extreme weather events will likely increase in the future. NOAA recognizes the risk this places on America's families, communities, and businesses. Therefore, in July, NOAA launched the Weather Ready Nation, a comprehensive initiative. This Weather Ready Nation initiative is about making America safer by saving more lives and protecting livelihoods as communities across the country become increasingly vulnerable to severe weather events. NOAA's Weather Ready Nation end goal is to help people make better decisions with better information. Our job is not done once forecasts or warnings are issued. Our success is not based solely on metrics of accuracy or lead time. Success depends on understanding and addressing the human dimensions of response. Success means building resilience to weather-related events. We can't do this alone. We need partners and other agencies across all levels of government, 
emergency managers, researchers, the media, insurance industries, nonprofits, and more to work with us to achieve the vision. Weather Ready Nation strategically aligns resources within NOAA and beyond. We need a nation that's ready, responsive, and resilient to extreme events. A key part of the Weather Ready Nation initiative is a national dialogue with the top experts, key stakeholders, and America's weather enterprise. The history at NOAA as it relates to social science is that we often tap social scientists late in the game when the criteria are already set, the problems are already defined, the approaches are already articulated. In contrast to the way we have done this in the past, social science is being incorporated from the outset in the Weather, weather Ready Nation initiative. The purpose of the dialogue is to examine what we know and what we can do in the short and long term to improve the nation's severe weather forecasts and warnings and community preparedness. So what does this dialogue look like? We had one in Norman on December 13th to 15th. The focus at Norman, Oklahoma was improving resiliency to severe weather with a special eye toward tornadoes. Their purpose was to initiate a national con conversation among the users, service, and science communities, both physical and social sciences, including key stakeholders and America's weather enterprise. The goal was to identify, to prioritize, and to set in motion actions to improve the nation's resiliency against severe weather, especially tornadoes, to protect lives and property. Nearly 180 participants from academia, social science, media, private sector, emergency management, community leaders from all over the U.S., including folks from Joplin and Tuscaloosa, who saw the first, firsthand the devastation caused by the spring tornadoes in their area. From Joplin, emergency manager Keith Stammer attended, <clears throat> as did Ken Horst of Tuscaloosa's Fire and Rescue Services. At the symposium, Noah heard loudly and clearly the value of integrating social science methodologies and concepts from the very beginning of all that it does. The word cloud that you see on this slide here uh, comes from over 50 pages of notes taken at the December 13th to 15th symposium in Norman. The more often a word was used in the notes, the bigger the font. More specifically, we must engage the social science community from the beginning as partners and not as an afterthought. Some of the priorities that came out of the Norman Symposium include bringing corporate America into the conversation, including the risk management community, honing in on basic and applied research questions, Fully integrating the social science community with the weather and climate communities means a significant and a sustained commitment. We must share in this commitment both the human capital and the dollars across government agencies. This is not something that NOAA can do alone. We must commit to collaborating across disciplines. We must develop mutual understanding and respect for each other's expertise and we must identify and address the gaps in knowledge and tools. Now is the time for us to act as a cohesive Weather Ready Nation community to tackle these problems. Now is the time to invest in understanding just how it is that people interact with weather, how their understanding, their perceptions, their uses, their experiences, their environment, and their culture all intersect with weather. How committed is NOAA to integrating social sciences into our Weather Ready Nation initiative? Our commitment starts with the Coastal Environmental Impact Decision Support Services in New Orleans, a pilot that we just kicked off last Saturday. IDSS is the provision of additional assistance to decision makers to ensure correct interpretation, to ensure the most relevant information is presented in the proper context for the decision maker and to avoid breakdowns in communication between NOAA, our core partners, and end users. In general, these pilots will take an approach of integrating, from the outset, impact-based decision support services and social science into the way that we operate. 
The concept is build a little, test a little, field a little. The purpose of IDSS is to provide in-person, on-the-scene decision support during high-impact events. To jumpstart this process, <clears throat> National Weather Service forecasters will be trained as emergency response specialists. These specialists will be the frontline rapid responders who provide high-quality observational and forecast information to our core partners. NOAA will work closely with its core partners to minimize societal and economic impacts of weather and man-made hazards and to educate core partners about IDSS to ensure that they are aware of these unique emergency response capabilities and be able to incorporate them into their decision-making processes. Some of our core partners include FEMA, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Geological Survey, EPA, and other state, federal, and local agencies, as well as national and local media. NOAA also has a number of social science research projects underway that relate to risk communication and economic valuation. They include things like storm surge, hurricane forecast improvement projects, tsunami emergency management decision support, coastal resiliency, climate regional integrated sciences and assessments, RESAs, just to give you a sense. A little bit more about climate RESAs. NOAA's climate program recently established a regional decision support effort to accelerate interaction with users of climate information and forecasts at multiple spatial and geographical scales. The RDS portfolio supports decision making through an integrated program of research and assessment related to impacts and decision making needs, transition of research to operations, and operational production and delivery of local and regional climate services that can be utilized to enhance adaptive management options. The newly established NOAA Sector Applications Research Program will identify and promote research and application priorities that foster improved decision support for fundamental climate-related issues in key socioeconomic sectors. The Social Vulnerability Index is one useful tool being developed in partnership with the University of South Carolina. Social vulnerability measures characteristics of human populations that influence the ability of places to prepare for, respond to, and recover from hazards and disasters. The index can be used to compare places according to their social vulnerability, generally at the county or sub-county scale. Just as the landscape of hazards varies geographically, so too does the landscape of social vulnerability. Social vulnerability has many dimensions and using only a single attribute, such as age or income or family status, does not, actually, does not accurately capture the dynamic intersection of factors that produce social vulnerability of communities. And finally, the HFIP program. The HFIP Socioeconomic Working Group is initiating socioeconomic research that focuses on people's perceptions of risk and uncertainty associated with tropical cyclones and storm surge forecasts and warnings. The project will look at cone of uncertainty, six to seven forecast track, and geographic and textual conveyance of information. In short, 2011 has been a wake-up call for NOAA, and we are responding by taking action. More than 1,000 Weather-related fatalities and more than 8,000 injuries occurred in 12 months. We saw record-breaking snowfall, cold temperatures, extended drought, high heat, severe flooding, violent tornadoes, and massive hurricanes. We have documented the greatest number of multi-billion dollar weather disasters in the nation's history. What does the future hold? The recently released IPCC Special Report on Managing the Risks of Extreme Events and Disasters to Advance Climate Change Adaptation says that we can expect the following five things. One, it is virtually certain, 99 to 100% probability, 
that increases in the frequency of warm daily temperature extremes and decreases in cold extremes will occur throughout the 21st century on a global scale. Two, it is very likely, 90% to 100% probability, that heat waves will increase in length, frequency, and intensity over most land areas. Three, it is very likely, 90 to 100 percent probability, that average sea level rise will contribute to upward trends in extreme sea levels in coastal high water areas. Four, it is likely, 66 to 100 percent probability, that the average maximum wind speed of tropical cyclones will increase throughout the coming century, although possibly not in every ocean basin. And five, it is likely, again 66 to 100 percent probability, that the frequency of heavy precipitation or the proportion of total rainfall from heavy falls will increase in the 21st century over many areas of the globe. Now is the time to take bold steps to build a weather-ready nation, one in which the public understands the threats of weather, in which communities prepare in advance, in which timely and credible warnings are issued, and in which people take prompt and effective action. The result? Fewer deaths and economic losses from severe weather. NOAA is committed to social science research that helps us become weather ready. Dialogue and partnerships will be key to the success of this endeavor. Our network of partners and emergency managers and the commercial weather enterprise who help identify, prioritize, and set in motion actions to improve the nation's resiliency against severe weather are invaluable. This is about resiliency. Reducing fatalities and injuries requires a continued investment in research to understand the physical science behind the many types of weather phenomena, to develop new technologies and adapt existing technologies and mainstream them into operations. Resiliency is multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary. We cannot afford for any discipline to live outside of our efforts. Resiliency is also about examining infrastructure, communications, construction of buildings, consideration of mobile home parks, availability of EF5 res resistant structures, and so on, and then moving ahead to rebuild. What about after the fact, after a disaster has happened? How do we rebuild? How does a community come back? Resilience sits in our ability to do all of these things, not just one or two of them. In summary, we are excited about the new directions that we are headed in. We recognize how important it is that we move ahead in collaboration with the community that's represented here. We need and invite your full participation in this challenge of creating a weather-ready nation. We at NOAA look forward to collaborating and carrying forward this dialogue with you. We invite you to help us build a ready, responsive, and resilient weather-ready nation. Thank you very much.